Hey, y'all. Uh, how we doing? All right. Um, you know, the joke is that we're now on to the music portion, so nobody gets up before noon, so that's okay. Um, uh, my name is Austin Cleon. Um, I am a local writer. Um, I've written a couple of books about creativity, and I'm super stoked today to have uh, Mac and Laura from Super Chunk with me. Can you give them a big hand? Thank you. Me in here. Um, this is going to be kind of a two-part um, conversation, although we're not going to divide it up or anything. Um, so we're going to talk about the new, um, the new Super Chunk record. How many people have heard the new Super Chunk record? Okay, excellent. That's awesome. Um, it's fantastic. Uh, I love it. Um, let me animate the skull here so he's actually, uh, so he's actually, there we go. Okay, yeah. <laughs> so we've got our fancy animation there. Um, uh, and then we're going to talk about merge. Um, I was going through my records last night, and I couldn't believe how many great merge records I had, actually. And my, my wife told me not to bring them all here today, um, that that would be too nerdy. Um, but my, my son, I, I had the new record out, and my sons love to draw skulls. And so they were like immediately drawn to the record. And my son Owen, he's five, he can read now. He's like, Super Chunk, oh yeah. He's like, is this, is this their like first record or second record? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, "Well, it's they they have actually they have actually been playing in a band almost as long as Papa has been alive." He goes, "Oh." And then he goes, "Um, are they alive?" <laughs> Barely. <laughs> but um so I I I'm thrilled today and 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 I'm I'm really excited um and uh I just wanted to get a show of hands real quick. How many people in the room are musicians? Okay, so a few. And how many people consider themselves in the music industry in some capacity? Okay, and then how many of you are just super chunk fans? Awesome, okay, so uh, that, that'll, I think that's gonna influence what we talk about. Um, my first question, which, you know, I, I don't know how bored y'all are talking uh, of, how bored you are of talking yet about it is, is just, um, why now? Why a new Super Chunk record? Like, what was, what was the thing that just, that, that made it happen? Well, the last record we put out was 2013, I think, so it has been a while, but, um, we're luckily in a position where we're not on a album tour, album tour cycle, and no one's expecting anything from us at any particular time, which is kind of nice because there's no pressure to make that record. But um, I started writing songs at the end of 2016, and after I'd written a couple, made a couple demos, to me, it became clear that they would be best as super chunk songs, and um, we looked ahead on the calendar, which is something that we have to do, <laughs> um, because we're all doing different things, and saw that it would be actually a year where we could find time to record and put out a record and play some shows. Our drummer John plays with Bob Mold Band and the Mountain Goats, um, so we're often working around his schedule, so there were some just logistical things that made it possible. But also, like I said, I felt like the songs that I was working on would be best as super chunk songs. And then we just figured out times when we could, could make the record. One of the, so one of the books that I might refer to during the course of this conversation is a book called Our Noise, um, The Story of Merge Records. Um, if you guys haven't read this, this is great. This is a great um, history of the label, and there's tons of great, so don't get it on Kindle. Um, get it in paper, because there's tons of great pictures and artifacts. And one of the things that comes up a lot is, and I know we were talking earlier, is... Um, Four tracks. Um, I still have my old Task Tascam cassette four track, 
And it's still this, um, that's where I used to spend all my time and get my ideas. How do you keep track of your musical ideas now when stuff starts coming? Like what kind of technology do you use? Like, or what kind of, how do you keep track of ideas you're having? It depends on where I am and how much time I have. So sometimes I'll just use the voice memos on my phone if it's something that I'm just worried I'm gonna forget and I don't have time to set up microphones in my, I have a little studio in the uh, basement of our house where Superchunk also can, uh, it's just big enough for four people to practice in there. Barely. Barely. <laughs> um, and so, but if I have more time, I will uh, record stuff on Pro Tools, I have a super old Pro Tools set up, but it, I essentially use it like a four track. I mean, I think all the demos that I, I sent to the rest of the band for this record, None of them have more than four tracks. I could have done it on a Porta Studio if I yeah. still had mine set up. But um, so I, I, unless I'm actually trying to make a record on the, on that um, Pro Tools setup, I'm I'm basically using it like a like a four track. Awesome. Um, and I wanted to, you know, you brought up the basement. So a weird thing about Austin is there aren't any basements because it's too expensive to blow into the rock when you're building houses. Um, and we were talking earlier, um, Ian Spinonius, who I know y'all have worked with, um, he did this really hilarious piece for Marketplace, and he said, uh, and I, I'm not, I can't do Ian's voice, but he said, uh, the Clash said we're a garage band, but who can afford a garage anymore? <laughs> um, and his point that I thought was really interesting, and this was, this was a few years ago, he was talking about how real estate influences rock and roll. And he was kind of tracing the fact that space to play in has become so expensive that he felt that some of the really burgeoning genres like folk or electro clash were actually happening because it was stuff you could do in your bedroom like or in your apartment where you didn't have to make a lot of noise. Um, I know that noise for me when I was growing up, like having a space to make noise was like a really big deal. Um, how do you, how do y'all feel about space? Like how, when you were coming up, like how has space affected the kind of music you've, you've made? Like what? You... We always were living in neighborhoods in Chapel Hill where we could just practice in the house. Yeah. I don't know if our neighbors loved that, but. Or sometimes in someone else's house. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was one of the good reasons to live in North Carolina and not in New York. I guess this is, maybe it's obvious. Um, when we first started the band, everybody was like, okay, so are you gonna move to New York? And we were like, I know, because it's too expensive to live yeah. there. How, how would we live and eat? And, but also we could just leave amps and drum sets set up in our house, because we had houses big enough where we could do that. Um. I, so we, in my house, like we have, uh, you know, we, we're lucky we live in the burbs and we have like four bedroom and we only have two kids. So we have the music room with all the instruments just ready to go. And there's something about having a space available to you that you can just like go if you, if you're, you know, if you feel the muse or if you're, if you're just ready to do it. Um, do people ask, do you get, do you get like emails from young musicians asking you about the Triangle area or about North Carolina or what, how is, how has North Carolina affected you like living in the Triangle? I have a slide for this. If you guys don't know what the Triangle is. Um. <laughs> there it is. That's a pretty good illustration so, of why it's called the Triangle. So the Triangle is Durham, Chapel Hill and Raleigh. Um, in North Carolina. Is that isosceles? I don't know what kind of... <laughs> I, 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 <laughs> I threw this together this morning. But um, whenever I visit there, it seems like such an incredibly livable place. Um, I'm always kind of tempted to like look up the Zillow listings. I think it is. It's getting more expensive like everywhere. But yeah. uh, I think that, like Laura was saying, living in a place when you're young and you're doing stuff that's not gonna make you any money, like playing in bands, just having, being able to afford the rent in the house and have your band practice there, start your record label there. Um, 
you know, we had friends that lived out in the country and could practice out there because there's no one around. John, our drummer, lived in a couple different houses that had basements where we wrote all the songs for um, <clears throat> indoor living and here's where the strings come in and those records and it's just like having that, it's, it's like the slightly more grown up version of having the music room in your house if you're a kid. is like having the music room in your house as an adult where your band can practice um, and sometimes at all hours and I think it's, I think that living in a place like where we live that also has record stores, good rock clubs, college radio stations. It's all, it's not a stations. unique thing. There's places like that all over the country, but <clears throat> but I think that it definitely allowed us to become what, what we did. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about scenes. Um, you know, Brian Eno has this great, um, he, you know, he says instead of genius, he feels like a lot of creative work happens through what he calls senius, which is this whole, you know, kind of group of people who are influenced by each other and the kind of collective um, genius of a place. Um, do you, how do you feel like, because, you know, you've been in that area for so long, how has the internet changed for you what place is like has it because so much of you know i'm i'm someone who for me a, a lot of times a scene happens online there's this kind of feel of like a almost a vibe online and i've noticed that in some ways the internet you know the dream of the internet is that it connects people but in some ways i found that i feel like having a scene attached to a physical place has almost like it's been there's been less of that in my life have you felt like the internet like the, has the internet kind of changed um how you felt connected or like the scene around there or, or does that make sense that question um it does i'm sure the internet has made a difference but also my age has made a difference you like yeah. as i've gotten older i have become a little bit more isolated from the scene yeah where i live because i have a kid, I have, you know, less energy and desire to go and stay out until midnight or later. Um, and so I, I feel less connected to my local scene yeah. than I used to. But but I do think, like, the Internet does create communities, definitely, but it also isolates people. I would like to just make the baseline statement that I think the Internet ruined everything. <laughs> I don't think that anyone can argue against that statement. <laughs> yes, there are exceptions, but for the most part, the internet ruined everything. Having said that, <laughs> I, I think that, uh, you know, having a, having a record label, working with bands much younger than us is constantly inspiring. And um, when, we, when we started going to see bands that were in our town, like Palvo or like Archers of Loaf or Pipe, that that was very inspiring, just as as a peer, yeah. um, in terms of making us want to be a better band or like a better live band or write more interesting songs or whatever whatever it is that your peers make you inspire you to do, um, and to and just to see that it could be happening right next door or whatever was great, um, and and going back even further, going to high school. Uh, in a town where, yes, touring bands came through, but also Corrosion of Conformity, a great hardcore band in Raleigh. You could go see them, and that, that was inspiring. Um, but in, in terms of connecting via the internet or just feeling like a part of uh, a scene that's not necessarily your, your local scene, I do think that, um, like I was saying, working with bands like a uh, band like Waxahachie, um, on Merge, you feel a kinship with people that don't live where you live, but you share uh, an aesthetic and a, a work ethic and um, maybe political views or whatever. You feel like you're kind of working towards the same goals, even if you're making different kinds of music. Um, and so I feel like th there are scenes that aren't just local scenes that, are, that make you feel like you're part of a larger community. Um, but I don't know that the I, I can't credit the internet with that. You know what I'm saying? I feel like yeah. you can be. I, I mean, I felt like part part of a larger community the first time we did a tour and we met, you know, Calvin Johnson in Olympia or something like that. 
my, my problem with the way we talk about community and the internet right now is that I don't, I think that network and community are getting confused. Uh, uh, um, and this is certainly not original thinking on my part. I think there's a difference between a network and a community. And so I think one of the things that I think is really interesting, uh, because y'all are so, uh, you know, you've been in the same place for so long, I, I was just, I, I've been trying to push people that I know to think about that difference a little bit. Like what is a community and what is a network? Um, you know, is a, is a network laid over a community? Does it connect communities, that kind of things? And, and what kind of interactions can you get in a community or a neighborhood versus the network? Because I feel, and, and this might, I'm gonna have a point here. Um, <laughs> we were talking earlier about you know, just the, the craziness and the politics that's going on, what's going on in our country right now. And um, this, I, I think this record, I, I think, you know, some people are calling it a protest record, but I think it really, I think there's, a, there's an energy and an anger here that could have come out any time in the last, you know, 30 years. Um, I wanted to ask you, though, about, Laura, we were talking a little bit earlier about standing up and having the courage to be, uh, to, to have your political views known. Um, could you talk a little bit about the hesitation of people in the industry to kind of come out um, in, in the resistance or whatever you want to call right. it? Um, well, I think a lot of artists feel like they shouldn't express a political opinion because it may alienate some of their fans. Um, and I feel kind of like it's the responsibility of artists to express their political opinion. And in, in when, when it feels important, you know? Yeah. Um, and, but this is a, a tricky time for doing that because it's so, um, there's, the internet has enabled <laughs> this kind of um, this weird aggression that people can have with, when they're anonymous. Yeah. Um, and so like people, you know, have hesitated to come out on one side or the other because they don't want to lose fans. But also there are people who have hesitated to like, we were trying to get people to do this, these, this series of videos to um, try to save the ACA. Um, like a year ago, and um, one of our artists didn't want to do it because she was afraid that um, it would make her a target yeah. to trolls or whoever, you know, to hate. And um, and I totally understand her not wanting to make herself vulnerable that way. Yeah. Um, but also, but I think like, where we can and where we can feel relatively safe about it, it's, it's, it's we've made the choice <laughs> to yeah. make a statement. <laughs> well, and I wonder again about that community versus network thing. It seems like if you make, it, it seems like your community is really the place to start. I mean, I know I, I, for me, it feels like to be out on the street or to be engaged, like my wife's a block captain. For our, for our street, and she goes out and reminds everybody to vote. It, right. Just that kind of local, there, yeah. there's something about local action that I think is almost, you'd almost think that like being in the street is, is more dangerous, but I almost think in some ways being on the internet can be more dangerous, and so I- Because you don't know, know who you're you, dealing with. Yeah. Well, and, and you know, social media offers this like platform, which I in, completely indulge myself, where you feel like you're making a statement or you feel like you're talking to people, I mean, you're just kind of shouting into a void in some ways, you know what I'm saying? Whereas meeting with people in, in person or playing a show if you're a band or going to a rally or a march or something with a group of other people, I think that is a, a, a more visible statement, it's a more powerful statement and I feel like it resonates for me personally, it's much more satisfying, you know what I mean? Yeah. And I think that in some ways making a record, for instance, 
um, is a way to make making a record now for us would have been weird to not kind of an acknowledge what's happening. It's not so much like, I need to address this and people are waiting to hear from Superchunk about the political situation in our country. Like, no one's waiting for that. But, uh, but at the same time, it'd be weird to make a record and not have the songs reflect that somehow. And so I wouldn't say that the record is a protest record, but it's just songs about living now. And, you know, it's not a record that's going to make um, Paul Ryan wake up one day and go like, what an idiot I've been this whole time, you know? Yeah. But it's a record that, m you know, maybe for us is just a way to exercise what we know how to do, which is make records. And that alone is good for me personally as a, something, you know, to not, if you're writing songs and like recording songs and playing with your band, that's like a solid amount of time that you're not looking at fucking Twitter or whatever, you know? And I think that for people who are listening to the record and enjoy the record, it's a time when they can either just be listening to it as like, I love listening to rock music, or listen to it and feel like, oh good, I'm not the only one who feels so anxious all the time about the state of the world. You know what I mean? I think yep. there's a lot of things that you can get from art that don't necessarily have to be um, a, pro a protest per se or a suggestion of like a, a, a policy position or something like that. It's more just like, um, I feel like it, hopefully music is community generating there was a there was a great line at the New York Times did a piece about y'all and and there was a great line I think it was in the same piece by Ted Leo and he said um, he said you know even preaching to the choir like he was talking about preaching to the choir and he was like it gets a bad rap but he's like preaching to the choir is a kind of community building in a sense yeah I like that know? that was a, that I was a good that line, line. And it, and it really, um, there's just something about that human connection, which brings me to a, a let's, let's do another slide here. Uh, <laughs> so um, I, I love this image because I feel like this is Merge, like this is Merge Records to me. So this is, this is what you see on the back of a mailer uh, when you get uh, like records from, uh, mailed to you from Merge, packed by humans. Um, from Merge Records, Durham, North Carolina. Um, there's some beautiful stories about when y'all got started, how you would have your seven inches pressed and then you'd photocopy the artwork and then you'd have these great um, stuffing parties. Is that what you called it? Like, it was like, yes. like, like stuffing parties where you'd take the record and you'd glue the, the, the paper and put the record in there. Um, I'm showing my millennial age here. Like I'm trying to explain <laughs> this. So you had these things, and you that folded you put the paper. paper. And, um, but you put uh, Austin, it's like an MP3, but you <laughs> have to actually like put this piece of plastic on the thing. <laughs> so, <laughs> my my son. It by streams, the way. but it's streaming from this machine. That's like it's a little bigger than your computer. So, <laughs> but what was interesting is when I was talking, so Mike from Merge is here and, and he's about my age and he was saying that it's still like that at Merge, that there are still- Yeah, but now we have to pay people. Right. <laughs> we used then to just like just buy like, some beer. Yeah, buy some beer for your friends. <laughs> they help you put records together. So one of the things um, that I wanted to ask, particularly Laura, I really wanted to ask you about with Merge is, um, there are there's so there's so much bad slogans around creativity, um, which is kind of the, the thing that the the, the uh, anyway. Uh, there's so many bad things that people say about creativity, and one of the things I've heard before is that you can't be a cautious creative. Um, and every, you know, that you have to take great risks if you're a creative person. That you have to like go out jump on off a the ledge, cliff, jump off a cliff, you know, skydive, blah blah blah. Um, and one of the things I was thinking about with Merge, so Merge came from, you know, you guys were on the road, and there's 
from the merge signs on the highway. And one of the things that I was thinking about with merging is that you have to be cautious that you actually, in order to merge on the highway, you have to look and you have to see where you're going. And I, now I'm not sure that that's what you were thinking. We of. didn't put that together yeah. at all. I, 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 I figured. <gasps> but what I think is so cool about the merge ethos is that there is calcul if, if there are risks, they are calculated. And there is a kind of, um, could you talk about just um, being like financial responsibility and how you balance how you balance the business stuff with the the creative stuff. It, I know that's very vague and broad. Well, but what I mean, do you think about being a, a creative person who's also cautious? I feel like sometimes be, I, because of the way people talk about creativity, I think I've let it lead me to believe I'm less creative than people who do throw all caution to the wind. Just complete bullshit. <laughs> um, but I feel like uh, I believe in sustainable creativity. And, and um, uh, if, we, if we blow it by being too in, in cautious, is that a word? Um, then... It is now. <laughs> then we're not going to get to be creative in this way anymore. So, so, you know, I've always, I've always um, felt like in the long run, we, we want to be able to keep doing this and we want to be able to do it in a way where at the end of the day, our artists actually get paid um, instead of at the end of the day going, look, wasn't that great? You didn't, you know, you didn't get anything out of this in the end except you know, maybe some people heard your record, but isn't that great? <laughs> I feel like, sorry, I'm gonna do my slides here. What's this place? That, it looks like they took the bushes away. That was my house where we started Merge Records, like it was in my bedroom. So Merge- It's way this, smaller looking than I remember it. <laughs> this like, so this is the birthplace. And then we skip a place because that place has been bulldozed, I think. Yeah. That, that house is bulldozed. And then this is, how long ago was this, the merge office? That. That's that. probably like 95 to, or 96 to 2001. Yeah. Yeah. And then this is, is this where y'all still are? Yeah, we're the one with the yellower brick. Okay. Um, wherever that is. It's over there. <laughs> I um, can see it. Yeah. So With the tree in front of it. What has your philosophy been about? Because you've had. Um, can you talk a little bit about reinvesting in the business and and what your ethos has been about? Like when you, uh, you know, how you've taken because you've had big, like when Arcade Fire came out and and that kind of thing. How you took success and, and turned it into something more sustainable or right. what your ethos was? I mean, really, you know, our first successes were putting out super chunk seven inches that people actually bought. And like, you know, we had $600 and we made it into $1,000 right. and we put it right back in the business. You know, it, in the early days, especially like we were selling tiny little things and we, all the money would just get plowed right back in. Um, nobody was getting paid anything, you know, we'd put out a seven inch by a, another band and we'd go, we'll give you 50 of these seven inches and you can sell them and that'll be the money you get back, you know. Um, but the rest of it went back into Merge and, and we have maintained that, like, you know, the Merge side of the profit goes back into Merge. Has so, there been pressure from outside for you to expand? You know, the thing you always hear about business is like, well, if you're not expanding, you're not doing business. There's been, I mean, there's been internal pressure to, that, you know, as we have had bigger records, it makes sense. You kind of, you kind of have to spend more money and make things that, f or make moves that feel risky. Um, spend money that, you're not sure it's going to work because you've never done it before. Um, so there's that kind of pressure, you know, and, uh, 
as an as an industry, I think in general, as time has gone on, that like as an indie label, we've gotten more and more um, pulled into the ways of operating that more ma like major labels do, um, because. Somehow, indie, you know, luckily, indie labels have sort of climbed out of this little gully and in, on towards the plateau where, where the majors are. And, and um, we have to play the game more than, than we used to, which, which means spending more money, which I don't like. What, she, what <laughs> she's saying is that no one's selling records anymore, including <laughs> indie labels and major labels. That was going to be a question of mine. I felt, I feel just as a consumer that streaming has probably been more um, destructive to record sales than Napster ever was. Is that true or is that because I, f and, and this is why, um, when, when Napster or file sharing came out, you had to go to the trouble of like having a collection and having an iTunes or Winamp or whatever. And now I feel like it's all at a, the touch of a button and you carry it around with you all the time. Have you, have you felt like streaming has been like more, I don't want this to turn into just an industry panel, but, uh, <laughs> but did you feel like streaming has been more destructive to record sales or, or just Definitely. pretty much the same? Yeah. Definitely. So people in my industry, in the book industry right now, we're, we're terrified. You know, music, music is always the canary in the coal mine, in, in a sense. You always look to music for what's going to happen to you down the road. And those of us who are really, you know, interested in it, I mean, streaming looks like a nightmare for us. Like, once people can start just, um, you know, they just subscribe to something and your book is just part of a thing, that's, that's really, that, that's terrifying to a lot of us. Um, let me let me think of something fun I can ask you. But it's not, <laughs> um, um, I know. So it is. Um, it's school walkout day right now, and I know you both have teenagers. And Laura, your teenager's walking out today. Yes, right? she is. Um, how does having teenage? How does having kids like? How has it affected you creatively? Um, I you know there there's other bad uh, information about creativity where. People say, you know, anger doesn't lead to good creative work. And I always think of Henry w Rollins, who says, I'm angry and curious, and that keeps me going. Mm -hmm. um, how's having children affected both of you creatively? Like, how have your kids influenced your work at all, if, if at all? I listen to a lot more pop music yeah. than I ever, <laughs> than I have in the last 30 years. What's the big thing now? What's the big pop? Who's big right now? Like what's what's that your daughter listen to? Marshmallow head guy. <laughs> <laughs> what's his name? That's a hot tip, people. Yeah. <laughs> so so my son's Marshmallow five. Marshmallow head guy <laughs> blowing up. My son's five and he doesn't go to school yet, so he only thinks that Beethoven and Kraftwerk are the only two people that exist. I'm keeping that stream trim to the very end. My daughter's fourteen and she was looking at, when I told her I was coming to this, to South by Southwest, I think she imagined that it was like a, a music festival like Coachella or something like that, which she's also not been to, but she's seen pictures. And she was going down the list of artists and she's like, oh my God, dad, you have to see. And then she listed like eight guys I've never heard of before. <laughs> um, and the, uh, and then she listed Billie Eilish, who I went and saw last night, who was great. And so I, I was kind of proud that I could find someone that my daughter was interested in to, go, to tell her that I actually managed to go see while I was at this festival. Um, but her, her tastes are very mainstream, mostly hip hop, um, some of which is great, some of which is garbage. And she, she's always sending me links, you know, you gotta hear this, isn't it great? And I'm like, no, it's not great. <laughs> but you enjoy. Um, but I'm just glad that she's into music and the 10 year old is into music. I'm just glad that they're enthusiastic about it. And so, you know, as we all know, because we're at this music conference, more people are listening to music than ever. People love it. And, you know, it's very hard to get paid for making music. Um, and so that's the 
that that's kind of the consequence of the streaming that you're talking about. But the um, I did get some confirmation from my teen my teenage daughter recently when she was like, "Dad, do you guys um, play that song? Uh, my gap feels weird." I was like, "Yeah, we play that sometimes." She's like, "That's about when I lost my tooth, right?" And I was like, "Yeah." And she's like, do you guys play that other song, Crossed Wires? I was like, yeah, we play that sometimes. She's like, yeah, those are two bangers. Oh. <laughs> it's like, all right. I got to say, I got to say that, like, it doesn't bother me at all that my daughter listens to pop music. And I, like, I think about what I was listening to when I was her age. And it was, what she's listening to is way cooler. Yeah, I listened to some terrible music I when I was to, like, 13, sticks. 14 years old. Yeah. And... Music box dancer. Does anybody remember that horrible song? That like I had bought the seven inch. I went out and I bought the seven inch of that. In whatever year that was. I won't say what I was listening. To. <laughs> um, well, I think there's a Stafford Beard quote that he says, you know, if you can understand your children, we're screwed because we're not, you know, making progress. So um, I want to ask you about the artwork on this new record um so i if if i'm correct you two you you two used to actually not you two the band you two um <laughs> you used to swap um records to do the artwork for is that true mm -hmm. trade off and is it also true um that this is the first record that you two have collaborated on visually yes yeah okay so how does the artwork because i'm i'm i know you're a visual thinker, Laura, and I, I certainly am. Like, when does the artwork start happening in the course of a record? Hmm. Do, you, does, do you start getting images in your head? Or For me, it's usually after we're done recording. After, yeah. I think it's usually during the, the writing. Okay. Or maybe during the recording, when it starts to sound like a, a record or something. Tell me more about this skull cup. <laughs> well, how did that come to you? I w I've been wondering. I don't know, but it was like stuck in my brain for a long time. And usually there's v various iterations before it becomes the the final thing, like really bad versions until it gets closer to what the the real thing is. And there is a song on the record called Lost My Brain. This wasn't supposed to be like an actual illustration of losing one's brain. Uh, and having it replaced by a bouquet of flowers. But um, I just like the idea of, I mean, skulls are just great, right? Your kid loves drawing skulls. Who doesn't like drawing a skull? Everybody. It's hard. It, it is hard. It took a lot of tries um, to get one that you can't, it's hard to draw a skull that's realistic, so you kind of got to throw that idea away and just get a little more cartoony. So is it a skull or a skull cup? It's a skull that's been turned into a vase. Um, and Laura is a great illustrator, and so I thought, that, and the, the skull itself is a woodblock print, which I've been doing for a long time, and so I thought it would be cool if um, the vase, the skull vase, had some flowers that Laura drew as the bouquet for the, for the thing. So Laura drew a bunch of different ones, and then... Um, so we could arrange them in different ways and see what see what looked good. Awesome. It's the first time I've ever collaborated with anyone visually, and it was hard. I was like, "What? You want me to do what?" <laughs> well, that's <laughs> okay. That's I got to give up a little bit of control. Well, I think that collaboration is like a learned thing, but it's super um, gratifying, and when when you figure out how to do it. And I think that one thing that, you know, making records for almost 30 years, the first couple records, it was like, we know what we want our record to sound like, you know, which is why it sounds shitty. Um, and later on, when you kind of like let go of some of that to a, a producer that you trust, you know, or an engineer that you trust, it's, um, I don't know, it makes the process more interesting and more and more fun sometimes yeah you just want to do something from start to finish your own way but when you can figure out how to collaborate and you know we had um, several different vocalists on this record any vocalist besides myself on a song is going to just improve that song so we had I think five different people that sing on this record besides us besides people in the band 
And um, that's another way that, you know, you can hear your song one way, and then when you hear it with someone else singing on it, it's like a different, better thing, you know? Cool. Well, speaking of collaboration, um, we got like a nice little intimate crew here. So I actually want to invite you, if you have any questions for Mac and Laura, like um, there are two... There are two mics here on the um, on the at hall here, and uh, sorry, I'm, I'm, my language skills are deteriorating. The aisle here. There's two mics. Um, if you have a question, like go ahead and walk up to the mic. Um, otherwise, I'm just gonna keep asking them questions. And, and while they're working up the nerve, I don't know if you have a picture of the back of the record, but the back of the record is a photo of a Confederate s soldier statue that they pulled down in front of the Durham. Uh, courthouse that just because they're just made so crappily just collapse like a inflatable raft or something. And I think what's interesting about a lot of those statues is they were put up in like the 50s or the 70s. Yeah. Or something it was like a reaction yeah. to, to in integration. Yeah. So they're n it's not like some heritage no. thing that, yeah. Anyway. Um, so yeah, if you have any questions, please feel free to pop up. If not, I'm going to ask them more questions. Are hey, you going to go. put up your awesome slide? I am going to put up my <laughs> Q&A slide if I can get to it here. Uh, uh, just a couple of rules. Uh, <laughs> ask actual questions. No two-part questions. And no, uh, this is more of a comment. Thank you so much for no more of a comment. <laughs> Yes, uh, I have a friend who uh, owns an indie label, and he tells me that streaming is actually paying the bills right now. So even though you know we hear stories about you get a fraction of a penny for every stream, so I'm just wondering in terms of like catalog sales, new sales, streaming, you know, licensing, what what keeps the lights on at Merge? I mean, I think the short answer is it's a combination of all those things that you kind of have to put together to survive. Um, but I don't know, Laura, do you want to talk about actual ratios of things? Do I? It's, it's, um, I mean, it's true there, uh, the, the, the percentage of income we get from streaming now is, uh, greater than you might expect. I guess the, the thing that, um, that is disappointing about it is the, the the what it means is people are buying less of the other things and it it adds up to a smaller total. Um, yeah. I mean, I think that when we started the label, we started it as music fans, and same with the band. Like we were trying to be like bands that we liked and um, like record labels that we liked, and I and and I still think that you know, records, CDs, physical media is a very engaging thing for, for people, whether you grew up listening to it that way or someone who's um, my daughter's age who doesn't listen to the vinyl copies very often, but she will still get vinyl copies of new records and then just stream Also it. stream it. And just stream I it mainly that. is how she listens to it. So I think that there is this connection that you make with whether it's a book or a record that's real and a human thing. Now maybe we'll evolve out of that, but I think that that's that's still a real thing. So even though you know vinyl sales are good, they're not going to save us as a record label. But I still think they're important to me as an artist and to me as a, a label owner as something that engages fans. Um, with the, the the music that we're that we're putting out, I do want to point out though, like when we started Merge, it was at a time that is more like now in a weird way than the last, you know, than than, than from peak like CD. than peak CD and download selling, pure profit <laughs> um, was, and I I think that. Um, the music industry goes through cycles and always has of different formats creating different, um, you know, waves of of uh, profitability or or whatever or or engagement with the music industry. Um, and it's it's gonna it goes up and down and it's always going to, according to technology, um, and how it changes. I actually have a real quick question just before. Um, 
what's the best way that fans, in your opinion, can um, support the bands that they love? Like, what's the best as a as a and not just as like sharing the stuff, but like from a pure financial perspective? Go to the shows yeah. and buy the record from the merch table yeah. directly from the okay. band. So, I think that's always been my question. So you buy it from the merch, go to the show, buy it from the merch. But also you want to support your local record stores too because they're really important in the equation right. too. So buy maybe a t-shirt. go yeah, go so buy to the, the record. Go to the, the record, record store, store, buy the record, go <laughs> buy a t shirt. Go to the, the show. show and buy a t shirt. Okay. I don't know. All right. Cool. Let's take you. I know you said no to your part questions, but I, I swear. It's okay. <laughs> it's important. So, I mean, just speaking of going to live shows, who are you guys excited to see, if you have time or if you've already seen them at the fest this year? There are a couple merge uh, bands, and uh, but otherwise. And then the second part is just, um, yeah, uh, are you worried at all about, like whenever political records come out, I love the record, but it's always like, is it gonna age well, I guess? Like, or is it gonna feel relevant, you know, in five, 10 years? And I still feel like your first record still feels super relevant today. And I guess, what do you guys feel about that? Was that something you were thinking about when you were creating the record? Um, and is it something you think about listening to your previous records? Yeah, so those are my two questions. Answer the second question first. Yeah. Because that was a really great question. Thanks. Um, I think that, writing the lyrics for a record like this, I was definitely conscious, not of it, how it would sound in 10 years or something, but just um, not being, I, I think that writing lyrics in general is like walking a line between being specific enough to be really expressing the thing that you're thinking about, but not being so specific that to anyone else, it doesn't make any sense. And I think that um, that applies to, to this record as well. It's um, the difference between a bad lyric and a good lyric, really, right? Yeah, and so, you know, hopefully this record in 10 years will still make sense, but hopefully it won't still be as relevant, if that makes any yeah, sense. Yeah, let's hope. Let's hope. <laughs> um, but, but there will still be fun to listen to. Political outrage yeah. in one way or another. Uh, what was the first question? Um, the second question, or the first question was, um, who are you excited to see? Oh, yeah. Are there any acts that you really are stoked for? Well, obviously, all the merge bands that are playing. Um, so who are those? Just go ahead. Uh, yeah. Let's see. Oh, if I leave someone out, it's going to be terrible. Well, today, um, for instance, I know that Y Oak is yeah. playing on the radio stage here, and then they're playing later tonight as well. And they're, these are their first shows as a trio, and their new record is awesome. And I'm excited to see that lineup. All right. Ought is playing, um, and I'm going to try to get over and see the band Shopping, who are from Scotland, who I haven't seen before. They're playing at Waterloo today. Sneaks so. are playing. They're great. Mm -hmm. Check them out. What's the one merge band that you, or anybody in the catalog that you wish new people knew about, or more people knew about? There's so many. One? <laughs> All three. of them. All of them. Well, well, just, how about three? Uh, Vertical Scratchers is one of my pet favorites okay. of recent years. It's John Schmersel, who was, um, he's in Caribou, he plays in Caribou, but okay. he was in Enon and um, Brainiac. Brainiac. Um, and that record is so, we put out a record of theirs a few years ago, and it's, uh, I love it so much. It's like, it's, it reminds me of the kinks in a lot of moments. So vertical scratchers. And Laura mentioned Sneaks, who are um, playing uh, this week down here. It's great. Mac, did you have anybody that you just really wish more people? I mean, just one. Well, Sneaks was one. Sneaks popped to okay. mind because um, cool. I just saw them recently. But um, I don't know. There's too many that don't get enough attention. Underdogs. There's so many underdogs. We're playing some shows later this spring with the Rocketeens, a band from Atlanta, who are back together and um, have been doing some recording and um, we put out records by theirs a long time ago and I'm glad that they're back together again because they're awesome. Awesome. Question. Yeah, um, thank you all so much for coming. This has been uh, just really great to hear. Um, I wanted to ask you both, but especially Laura, if either of you all have thought about running for elective office. Weirdly, I have. People have been bringing this up because um, 
I won't shut up about like <laughs> trying to get everybody to vote and going to marches and trying to get other people to go. And I've thought about it, but I feel like I am not um, articulate enough. <laughs> it's the, it's really intim- intimidating to me to think about being put on the spot in that way. Like I'd have to. Uh, I don't know. Have you seen some of the dummies that get elected? <laughs> I have. I mean, that's gives. That's why I'm even entertaining the thought at all. You know, uh, I'm like do, I could do that. Do you? Do you? Feel I could like make you're... weird, dumb, off the cuff statements all the time. People love it. I think that this culture. I don't know if you've read Susan Cain's book, um, Quiet, but I think this culture is kind of. Um, we're prejudiced against introverts, mm-hmm. people who you know need time to think and and you know need quiet and and space. And uh, we were talking about one of your acts earlier, Stephen Merritt, who I actually got to interview. And um, one of the things Stephen has this kind of he's got this um, this reputation as being kind of a hard interview, but really what it is about him is he's incredibly thoughtful about his answers. And so he thinks before he speaks. And so I think for those of us, or not me, because I don't think unless I'm talking, um, but for those of us who you know actually think before we speak, I, I think that th- things are stacked against us, but I think that those voices are more, are more important than the other ones. So I don't know if they're more important. Any, well, Okay. Short, <laughs> I, I, Short I answer is Laura's running for office. Okay. You heard it here first, folks. <laughs> right here at South by Southwest. All right. Hi. One of the things I always found most like admirable about Merge is how like genuine it feels. Like especially being here at South by Southwest, where you have to sort of uh, balance between all the like cool opportunities of things here than seeing stuff like this. And then all like the buzzwords and throwing disrupt and like blockchain and everything that makes you want to like, <laughs> tear your hair out. We and went. Then, we almost went a whole panel without anyone saying blockchain or disrupt. Yeah. And then you just ruined it. It's Q and A. It doesn't count. Yeah. Okay. All right. It doesn't count. <laughs> but in in talking about collaboration on the new album, having like Stephen Merritt and like Katie Crutchfield and Sabrina Ellis on it, and it doesn't feel like a sort of thing of like well, we want this cross-brand promotion type thing. <laughs> it just feels like that you just want to uh, work with talented people that you like. And I just, just wanted to know if there was like a uh, concerted effort on that or if it's just like go with your gut and hope that it still feels like like a genuine effort. I think it was really just about asking and hoping that they would say yes, artists that we love their work as artists and we love their voices and and it, it was all people that we f- feel a kinship with and, and, and know already so it was not really like reaching out into some bizarro request you know that that um, to someone that we didn't have any connection to already um, so it felt like within the family kind of already within the community um, but you know especially with someone like Steven who doesn't perform loud music at all. Um, I love the idea of getting him to sing on a very loud Super Chunk song. I was sure he was going to say no. Because, I mean, I just hoped that, first of all, the song is called Erasure, and I hope that would help him say yes. He loves the <laughs> band Erasure. But, um, but also knowing he could do it in his... Okay, so th- I, I, I still think the internet ruined everything, but this is one thing that's an exception, which is that I can send an MP3 of a song to Stephen Merritt, and then like five days later he sends back four vocal tracks for our, to be on our song, which is awesome, and he can do it in his own studio at the volume that he prefers and and everything. So um, it's awesome that that all of these people are are on the record, but to answer your question, it was really just asking people that we that we liked and were friends with, you know. Can I say another thing in defense of the internet? I think it's been you can, you can try <laughs> to tear it down. I know you know it's fine, but I think it's been a great avenue of discovery. I think that we have benefited over the last fifteen years, fifteen to eighteen years from uh, from. The way the internet has enabled people to go like 
<clears throat> my friend told me something good about this band. I'm going to go and check it out and see, like, if I want to listen to this band or not. And I have a question about that. So um, one of one of one of the really great things about this book too is is you get to see all the old merge newsletters, which are actually typed or written by hand. I should have had a slide for them, but um, I feel that zines and newsletter culture from those that early analog area, where if you had like a photocopier and the postal service, I feel like that ethos of the newsletter, the zine is coming back now. I, I see a lot of independent artists I know, you know, they have like a mailing list and they do. It's a natural outgrowth of the artisanal movement. I, I think that, and I also think that it is a response to social media in that it's just like this big, you know, social media is just like you never know if anything's hitting or if you're connecting with anybody, but when somebody signs up for your mailing list, they're basically asking you to, 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 to reach them. They have to at least delete your email. And so my question was, what are the things that your artists or Merge in particular are doing that are keeping, um, keeping you best connected with your audience and your community? Like what kinds of things do you try to do at Merge? Do you have a newsletter? Do you have you know, social media? What, what, what do you we have all with? of that stuff. I mean, yeah. social media, you got to do it. Right. Um, we have an email sort of newsletter that goes out, I think it's once a month. Yeah. Um, and, and who writes that? Who writes the newsletter? Different people that merge our publicists cool. and okay. um, people in mail order. And cool. um, it's, it's a lot of, I mean, there is writing involved. We're obviously mainly trying to convey this information about new releases right. and things like that. Um, I, think, I think that in some ways, while we don't print a piece of paper anymore, I think that in some, some ways old-fashioned ways of conveying information are still successful for bands like playing i mean touring playing shows is really in my mind still like the best way to get your music out there in a way that impacts people and they remember it and they remember seeing you and and that kind of thing but i think that you know sending out the newsletter is important some people don't want to be on social media and but if they get an email that just says, like, okay, this tells me things I need to know. You know? I think also giving people the opportunity to sort of interact with you or the record or the, rec the art from the record in some way is a really good thing to do and makes people feel engaged. Like, like I'm not saying a lot of people came, but we did this thing um, when the Super Chunk record came out where um, a local record store got the materials together and and we went we met at a bar and we co made collages of the record cover like we tried to reproduce the record cover you know with with people that just showed up yeah um and that was really fun and it felt really yeah. personal and and um and and people like it you know and 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 that sort of thing like we also do contests sometimes where you know it can be like, like I don't know, fan art or remixes. Yeah, or or contests with like record stores to okay. like we're gonna send you some materials. Show us your cool record display. You know, <laughs> I I don't know the stuff where people get to like put some creativity of their own into the mix. I mean, I think that the zine um, culture, the way the the place I see it really living is. Uh, in some ways in the visual arts um, and uh, the artist uh, Andrew Quo who he used to do a fanzine like a music fanzine a long time ago um, called uh, Trash Heap named after a super junk song and he's a painter um, uh, he sent a couple zines that he made a while ago that were just um, images and words that he had taken from social media. Like one zine was just a whole compilation of people saying goodnight on Twitter, just page after page of that. Uh, and then visual artists, like um, there's a woman named Emma Coleman who um, did a cover illustration for the, uh, a single that we're putting out on Record Store Day. Cool. 
And she, um, we did a couple singles last year where we had an art auction that went with each single to raise money, one for Planned Parenthood and one for um, uh, Southern Poverty Law Center. And she was one of the artists that contributed. And again, she sent a couple zines along to the label and they're just, again, it's just illustrations. There's, um, but it's, it's like a version of a fanzine that I think is still v so different than anything that you could get from looking at something online. And so we made a zine um, with, the, with our new record that was more woodblock illustrations and more drawings from, from Laura and a poem by Amber Tamblin uh, and some lyrics from the record. And to me, it's just like another, it's like an accompaniment to the record. You don't have to hear the record to, in, to appreciate it, you know, or to kind of understand what's going on. Um, but if you do have the record, it's like another, it's like another component, you know. And I think that those kinds of things are engaging. And as a fan, you know, as I said, we kind of started all this as fans. Like, I love that kind of thing, you know. We're out of time. Thanks, y'all, for coming. And thanks to Mac and Laura. This was great. Thanks, everybody. Thank thanks, Austin. Read his books. Go to your record store, buy the records, go to the shows, buy the merch. <laughs> and have a good time. <laughs>